Uh, our next speaker is Sindhu Changud. She heads the open source business for Microsoft's APEC region and has been with Microsoft for four years. She's responsible for defining Microsoft's open source strategy and for growing cloud business in the APEC region through key partnerships. Has a B2B background across process consulting, marketing and strategy in the cloud, and to many more words, spreading much of the world. Uh, she's going to speak to us at greater length than we heard this morning about Microsoft's commitment to open source. Please go ahead. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm super excited to be here this afternoon with you. Uh, now, before I go into Microsoft and our commitment to open, openness and collaboration, um, I quickly want to show off hands on how many of you have doubts about this. Okay. Great. So, so I actually think my, my work might not be that hard or that hard to cut out this afternoon. I didn't see that many. But uh, great, great to see that. So, so let me share some more about um, what we've been doing the last couple of years. Um, let me move this in. Okay, I have a quick pop quiz before we start. Okay, and I do have a couple of t-shirts to give away. So, so let's see who's been catching up on, on Microsoft or what's been happening latest in the open source world. So which popular Windows app did Microsoft open source last week? OK, that was too many. You should have put your hands up. Now I don't know who answered. <laughs> can, can I have one person say that out loud, please? OK, great. So, so I'll get you a t-shirt there. <laughs> can we pass that around, please? All right, one more. Uh, and by the way, the calculator has been part of Windows since version 1, 1.0, since 18, 1985. So um, we, we just decided that we, we want to open source the application. Uh, the second, what percentage of virtual machines on Azure are Linux today? OK, I have, uh, so, so let me ask him. 80, OK, anyone else? I have one here. How much? Eighty percent. Okay. Any other? Okay. So, I think we have the closest one here. That's sixty percent today. So, uh, 80, 80 is where we'd like to get to, <laughs> but we are about sixty percent today. There we go. And the last one. Uh, how many patents did Microsoft bring to uh, to OIN in October 2019, 2018? Okay. There we go. So let, let's pass this on, please. So um, as you can see, Microsoft's been taking steps towards getting more open um, and uh, making sure that the Linux community is, uh, is getting all the support it needs. Um, we, we have been working very closely with uh, the open source community in general. And the 60,000 patents that we, we made available to OIN was to ensure that the Linux community does not have any more uh, you know, patent infringes or cases that they, they have to spend additional effort on. So, so let's move on. Uh, th these are a couple more interesting facts. So we just covered these. And um, so given the direction that our uh, new CEO, Satya, has been taking, uh, he, in the last few years since he came in, uh, he has been saying that we, we need to work a lot better with the developer community. Uh, that's been very core to Microsoft uh, since its inception, and uh, especially the open source community. So, so his belief is actually that judges by the actions we've taken in the recent past, um, our actions today, and what we will take in future. And uh, if you've keep been keeping up, uh, as I just showed you a couple of them, uh, lots, lots of action happening. So for me, in fact, as the open source lead, it's been super exciting because uh, it's hard for me to catch up what's happening internally. Uh, now this is, let's go back, sorry. Um, okay, there we go. So uh, since 2014 is where we've seen a lot more momentum happening, um, which, which started with uh, Satya embracing very openly that, that we do love Linux, and uh, it, the open source ecosystem is important for us. Um, he did, do, uh, uh, out, uh, so the .NET Foundation was created then, uh, .NET Core, as you probably know, um, and the 2015 VS Code was released. Uh, I think that that's, that was one significant uh, milestone that happened in 2015. 
uh, today, as of last year, that's in 2018, uh, VS Code was uh, announced as, I think it was by the Stack Overflow Developer Survey that happened last year, and uh, it was unanimously sele opt selected as the most popular editor. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's done, uh, you know, it, it's gone leaps and bounds since then. Um, HD Inside, uh, so you, I, I don't want to go through every single one of them, but the more important ones were when we joined the Linux Foundation in 2016, um, we, when we announced SQL on Linux, I think that was never expected. For years, we said that SQL is going to run only for the Windows ecosystem and nobody else. And uh, when we eventually launched SQL on, on Linux, uh, I think a lot of things changed. Uh, we've actually seen the biggest uptick for SQL and the growth for SQL since we went uh, supportive of Linux. So I think that that's definitely the way we see. Uh, and in 20, SQL 2019, there'll actually be a lot more features uh, that would be Linux and open source friendly that, would, that are going to be shared very soon. Um, so 2017, the, the, uh, the Azure Kubernetes service was launched. Uh, so this is making, uh, so the co-founder of Kubernetes, Brendan Burns, um, r r joined Microsoft as one of the, uh, the engineers, uh, and he's helped uh, improve the Kubernetes experience on Azure, uh, which means uh, for, from a developer's perspective, uh, it, it's, it's just going to be a lot more easier for you to use Kubernetes on, on Azure. Uh, and uh, what else? Yeah, we joined the, Lin the, the cloud native computing, the cloud, uh, cloud foundry foundations, uh, the database for Postgres, MySQL. So these are managed services. Um, for Postgres and uh, MySQL community versions. So which means you, you get the benefit of what you've been using already, but with cloud. So you get high availability uh, as well as the scale and the, you know, the ability to, to scale out whenever you need. So um, it, it just means you have that added advantage to the cloud. And uh, oh yeah, Databricks, Azure Databricks was announced last year. Um, and then the biggest one I think which was uh, last year, the biggest shocker was, was the GitHub acquisition. Uh, we did finish that last year, um, and I think initially um, I was at another event, and the first question I got asked was, oh my god, GitHub got acquired, what are you going to do with it? Um, I, I even read about a lot of people saying, I'm going to switch to GitLab tomorrow, and you know, all of that happening, uh, but I think eventually uh, we, we just let people wait it out and see you know, how it goes. I think to, today uh, the the change has just been that, yeah, we're still going to stay the same. GitHub doesn't change. Uh, in fact, you do have private uh, repos available for users right now. So uh, that's, that's probably one of the bigger changes that's, ha that's happened. Um, I think the last one, which I don't have up there, uh, 2019, that happened in January this year, was uh, the Citus acquisition. So we acquired a company called Citus so that our Postgres uh, managed service performance could be a lot better. Uh, Microsoft does believe, that one of the core, uh, like what do you say, beliefs is that we need to make sure that the experience is good. And if one of the feedbacks we got was the performance hasn't been that great, uh, you know, the next steps by engineering was that, okay, let's see how we can improve that. So this acquisition was one step in that direction to see how we could improve our performance of, of Postgres on cloud. Let me move on. Um, so, so it's a good segue to my next slide, uh, which talks about how we think about open source internally. Um, and uh, I just want to share that with you. So um, when we, we look at open source, for us, it's about innovate, contribute, and enable. Uh, what we mean by that is, uh, I will go into some details about this, um, but it, it just means that we not only want to be part of the community to give, but we, we also want to be contributing. Uh, we, we did, I think, before the GitHub acquisition, uh, the largest contributor in terms of code, number of lines of code, was, was Microsoft. Uh, so I think it, it's just been a logical move in that direction that we want to keep con contributing, but also make sure that uh, we, uh, we have people using uh, our open source software as well, um, and, and that that's a con continuous um, cycle. So um, let me go into the next slide. I'll, I'll go into why innovate. So, um, so I think the, the one biggest thing I want to call out here is VS Code. Uh, when it was outsourced in 2015, um, I think they, there was people, people still associated with Visual Studio and said, okay, I'm not touching it by a, a crowbar, right? 
but um, I think uh, we, we didn't have to, like right now, just going by last year's Stack Overflow uh, developer results, it's, it's quite obvious that uh, people have been picking it up from the open source community and the popularity has been growing just because it is super easy to use. And uh, Sudhir here, my colleague, will be giving us a little demo in a few minutes and you can, you can see how VS Code works uh, with Python specifically. Um, so um, I think among the other things, we, we've also contributed to other open source languages like R, TypeScript, PowerShell, uh, originally from Microsoft, but these are open source today. Um, and uh, if you look at some of the other things, like it's, it's the leading Linux innovator, uh, we have been contributing a lot to the Linux kernel as well since we joined the Linux Foundation, um, so on. So, so that's on the innovation piece. Um, so again, contributing. Um, we, we did contribute a lot of lines of code uh, to GitHub. Uh, it, it, so we see that as, a, as a something that, that needs to keep going on, uh, which means we not only take the best from the open source world, and we see that as important for our own software, uh, but, but contribu continuously contributing and giving back. Uh, and, um, and, and hence being platinum members of foundations like the, the Linux Foundation or the CNCF. And uh, lots, of, lots of communities, again, which have been built up. So that's from a contribute perspective. Uh, let's move on to the last one, which is uh, enable. And uh, so when I, when I spoke a few minutes ago about services like MySQL or Postgres, uh, the whole idea is to give developers the freedom to choose what they want. So you know, it doesn't matter what operating system you're using or what device you're using. It could be a Mac or it could be you know, um, a Windows device. But give you the choice. Give you the freedom to decide what you want to use and uh, use it the way you'd like it. So, uh, so we've been trying to make sure that we not only have our first party services, but also enabling a lot of the, the third party and the open source services today that are available on Azure so that the, the experience is seamless. So um, MySQL or Postgres is one of them. It's one such example. Databricks is another, Kubernetes. Uh, and then uh, we did recently also announce that OpenShift, Red Hat's OpenShift, uh, will be a, a, a PaaS offering on Azure. So you will see that coming very soon. Uh, it was announced last year, and you'll see OpenShift on Azure as, as, a, uh, as a managed service as well. Uh, and uh, let's see if there's anything else. So I think I've covered that. You can go on to the next one. So this is just a, a quick snapshot of all of the, uh, the technologies that are supported. This is not the end of it, but this is just uh, a quick summary of the most popular technologies that are supported on Azure. But um, it, it's, it's a lot it's a lot beyond what this is. Uh, we can just move on. And um, I want to reiterate that when, when we say we talk about Azure, um, we talk about Azure as a cloud for all, for everybody. And to bring whatever you are currently using, whatever, like I said, technologies or platforms you're already invested in, and bring that to, to Azure. Uh, to get the, 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 the scalability, the hyper-scalability or you know, the, the high availability, everything that, that, every benefit that you can get by using the cloud and running your applications in the cloud. So that, that's what we want you to benefit from. Uh, so um, from a productivity standpoint, it just means that uh, we, we want to make all of the, the tools, the best tools available, the best services available, uh, as well as the management, make sure that uh, from a productivity standpoint, um, developers are able to get their applications out there to the market and to their users as soon as possible without wasting time in you know, unnecessary uh, operational stuff. Um, from a from hybrid perspective, I think, it's, again, it extends to the same thing. That means you get the best of both worlds. So if your applications have been on-prem and you're trying to move to the cloud, you get the, the seamless experience of, let's say, you don't want to move everything. You want to just move some things because it's not an easy move. You have data, you have security, you have management. You have a lot of issues to deal with when you move from on-premise to cloud. And uh, the idea is that you may not be able to do, deal with everything together, but you choose what you want to keep on-prem, what you want to move to cloud, and uh, you get the best of that uh, seamless experience. Um, intelligent, because uh, there are a lot of today, uh, it, it, like the services that, that 
Azure provides you from a data perspective or from, uh, let's say, a, a machine learning cognitive abilities, uh, you will have AI embedded into everything. So AI or machine learning embedded into every service that that's being offered. So which makes it, it, it a lot um, intelligent for users to be able to, to get to uh, like improve their, their applications. You, know, you, you get a lot more than what you're, you're bargaining for. Um, and then trusted because uh, I think from our perspective, without customers asking us, it's super important for us to make sure that a privacy or security is very, very um, top notch. So we have a lot of ISO certifications, um, regional or you know, even country specific certifications, just to make sure that a privacy or security uh, standpoint, that that's not compromised on, on the cloud. Uh, so that, that's in short um, on the cloud. Can we just move to the next slide? So we want to wrap this up and give some time for the demo. Um, I've talked about this already. So from a, from a GitHub or an Azure perspective, both of these are just ways for, for you to have the better experience and that freedom. So it means whether you want to develop or you want to operate and finally deliver your application, it just means use both. Um, you can bring your own tools. We could go to the next one. Yeah, so bring your own uh, tools as well. So either use the services that Azure provides you or you bring your own tools, whatever you've been using, and you'll still have that seamless experience. That, that's the way it's intended to be. Right, so now let's move on to the demo. And these are some quick numbers, but I want to go to the demo right away. All right. Cool. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Adil. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, how we can use um, one framework or one uh, platform or one tool, uh, you know, to write a course, uh, which we love. Uh, some of you may be a uh, Python developer or maybe you love Node.js or maybe, you know, some of you, I'm assuming that, you know, love .NET as well. So how we can have a one tool which we can actually leverage to write, uh, uh, you know, uh, our, our lovable code, uh, which we do. So let me just go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So why uh, Visual Studio Code? The first one is uh, you can actually have Visual Studio Code uh, installed on your Windows box. You can have it on your iOS box. Or if you have a Linux box, you can actually go ahead and install it. So it's a cross-platform tool which is available, uh, which is make easier for you if you move from one pla you know, one operating system to another. Uh, you can still use uh, this tool. The second uh, good thing about the Visual Studio Code is it's lightweight. It starts really quick. Uh, and for example, if I just say, go ahead and use uh, Visual Studio Code, and I'm going to run it as administrator, and it's going to ask me permission, that's fine, and boom. Right? Because what happens is, you know, it it's doesn't have the capability that it has is all uh, with the extension that it provides. And that's the uh, another capability of Visual Studio Code. So what you can do is you can actually go ahead and add various extension that you are working on. For example, uh, on my screen, on the left-hand side, you can see I have uh, extension for the Kubernetes. What happens is, as soon as I install this extension on my Visual Studio Code, and once I configure, it basically shows all my cluster. I can actually go ahead and manage my cluster from here, or maybe if I want to run my kubectl commands, I can actually go ahead and do it from here itself, right? Uh, one of the services that we have on the Azure is Azure Machine Learning, learning Services. So that's also have an extension. So what I can do with this ex extension is I can actually go ahead and manage my machine learning services experiment, and I can actually go ahead and you know, uh, do some coding against it. Docker, all my Docker images, my containers, my registries are all available. I can play from here. Right? Now, what all extensions that are available, the other thing that you can do is you can go on the left hand side, you can search for the extension, whatever you uh, prefer, you can actually go ahead and search for it. If not, you can go for this site, which basically shows all the extensions that are available for Visual Studio Code. Go ahead and search, install it, and you're good to go. Right? Are they good? Cool. So now what I'm going to do is, uh, after .NET, I love Python most, right? And I, I think most of you agree because it's very simple. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, I'm basically going to uh, a Python script. So 
what this Python script does is, it basically, behind the scenes, I'm using a multi-model database in Azure Cosmos DB. And what I'm doing is, I'm basically connecting from here to create some databases, some collections, and I'm storing my NoSQL JSON type documents into my Cosmos DB account, right? And all the development, debugging, everything I'm gonna do from the user studio code itself. So I've already have my code ready on the center of the screen, uh, just to save some time. And you can see I'm uh, leveraging all the libraries, providing the configuration, initiating a client, and creating a database, uh, creating a container, and then creating a JSON document, and you know, uh, and then uh, once I insert those documents, I'm querying back, uh, querying back those documents, right? So this is the code. So what I can do is, uh, as you can see, the line number two after the import. I have some orange or red line, uh, which you can see over here, right? Now what it allows me to do is, I can actually go ahead. Not only I can develop and deploy this code, I can actually go ahead and debug the code in the Visual Studio it code itself, right? Which is, uh, this capability is provided by most of the uh, advanced editors, right? Now that's available in the Visual Studio code itself. So for example, if I just go ahead and say, one thing is, uh, before I go ahead and run that, I'll say control shift P, and it's gonna tell me which, interpreter you want to select. So as you can see, in my uh, Anaconda, I have two environments set up. Uh, so just you guys can trust me. You can see there's a two environment, Conta environment. Uh, so my, speed, my hand speaks more so. Okay, all right. So, um, is on? Okay. All right, so I, I have uh, two environments over here. And what I'm gonna do is, when I'm gonna select uh, control, see, uh, I think. I'm good without the mic, right? Okay, <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave it. Okay, so control shift P, and I'll select my interpreter, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna select my base, uh, Conda. Uh, once I'm done with that, I can right click and say, go ahead and run uh, this file in the Python interactive windows, okay? As soon as I did that, it basically going to run and it gives me the output on the right hand side. And I'm going to do that. But more interesting is, as a developer, when I write this code, I want to debug it, right? <coughs> I want to see which values those variables are holding, how my call traces are happening, and if I want to, you know, uh, figure out something at the runtime, uh, I should be able to do that, right? So what I'm going to do is, real quick, and say, so let's go ahead and debug. And now you can see, uh, it stopped at the line number two, and on the left-hand side, it basically shows me all the variables right over here, okay? And I can just say step over, step into, all the stuff I can do. So, and let's say if I want to add, I want to watch something, some variable, for example, what's there in the config, and I'll get the information, right? So as a developer, I can actually go ahead and troubleshoot uh, and figure out what's happening. And let's go ahead and run this. And if I go back, right, so as you can see in the bottom on the terminal itself, I get the response back. That means my all the documents get inserted. So if I go back into my Cosmos DB account and refresh the page, and you have to trust me that earlier there was no database in the collections. So I just created now, okay? Um, so I, ha I should have all the documents over here. Right? So I have uh, both the documents, right? Now, apart from that, uh, if I'm a Node.js lover, what I can do is I can actually still use the same uh, Visual Studio Code editor and I can run my Node.js code. And once I'm done with that, I can actually go ahead and run it. So I'm going to say node. Uh, that's the intelligence, autocorrect and int uh, intelligence feature of Visual Studio Code. So as soon as I'm going to write something, it's going to show me, you know, you want to do something, and I'm going to say log, and I'll get all this information. So I'll just go ahead and raise that, and let's go ahead and run this guy, and say node uh, app.js. Oh, hello from VS Code to the South Asia 2019 attendees. You want to say hi? Yeah, okay, cool. So uh, the last thing is, uh, I do have, so if you have uh, your Jupyter Notebooks, you can actually go ahead and run it over here as well. So I have a very simple code. What I can do is I can say, uh, again, I'll select my Python interpreter, and I can say right-click, 
run this in a Python interactive window because of, it's, Jupyter is already started as you can see on the right hand side, I will get the output then and there itself, right. So entire experience, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to develop, it is there in the Visual Studio code, okay. All right, uh, I think we are on time, cool, uh, maybe we can take a one or two questions if time permits. Pretty much for the second, thank you. Uh, cool. So, uh, we can take one question while we uh, hook up the next speaker. Sir. Um, so, it seems to me that at Microsoft wants to be taken seriously when it comes to open source, that uh, there's really one statement that, would, uh, that it could make for that, and that's to open source Windows. So, the question <laughs> is, so, here's the thing, it's like clearly the, el the elephant in the room, right? So what is Microsoft's thinking around this? I mean, they could, you guys could have commercial distributions. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, you wouldn't instantly lose your customer base overnight. So I'm just curious what that conversation looks like internally. Microsoft has done the unthinkable in a couple of years. Um, honestly, so when I, I joined four years ago, I used to be part of the, the Compete team. So I was like, wait, op open source is part of Compete? So, and then, you know, it's changed today completely. So what I see internally as well as what's been happening like, like with SQL and other things. So I wouldn't be surprised if it does. I can't comment on that today because I'm not the person mm -hmm. who decides. But um, I, I would just say wait and watch. All right. and, and I do hope that um, we've managed to, uh, to change some of your perceptions, the ones who raised your hands today. Uh, but feel free to reach out to any of us uh, if uh, you have any other questions. Uh, we, we'd love to get you, you know, we'd love to support you. Oh, thank you, Microsoft. Uh, next speaker. Oh.